Please join me in the reading of the covenant of this church, which we use today as the call to worship. Join me, please, in the reading. As part of this beloved community, I promise to strive to be my best self in all my interactions, assume the best intentions of everyone's actions, be mindful of our shared humanity in my communications, pause, reflect, and be part of the solution when things go awry. Thus do we covenant with one another. We like to greet each other as well as our Zoom friends. And uh, I want you to know I'm Ed. <laughs> now you and I are the congregation. This church is the congregation. So here we go. Good morning, BUCers. <laughs> I 
feel so welcomed here. <laughs> now, I also want you to welcome our speaker for the day, the Reverend Lisa Presley. Uh, Lisa was uh, a child in this uh, church, and so it's great to welcome her home, Lisa Presley. <laughs> Well, whether you're joining us here in the sanctuary remotely via Zoom, or watching the recording later, or being actually seated in this, this hall of worship, welcome. As a multi-platform church, it's important for us to build a bridge between online and in-person representations. So we call this connection, opportunity, greeting our virtual neighbors. And first, our technicians will bring up an image of the folks who are currently on Zoom. And they, if they're doing their part, are waving to us. <laughs> now we have the opportunity to wave back to them, so face the camera and give them a good, hearty wave welcome to BUC via Zoom. Now they feel as welcome as I feel. <laughs> well, whenever and however we connect with BUC, we are in fact building this church. We do it at home, we do it on this campus, we do it in the world, and every day, this congregation is building our own community. Now the first formal thing that uh, we traditionally do is to light a flame in the chalice. The chalice, of course, is a universal symbol of Unitarian Universalism. Around the world, a universal symbol. And so with Reverend Lisa's assistance, we do that now. We light a flame of love and reason, respecting all in this community of seekers of truth, of justice, and of compassion. We are seekers of light, of reason and the warmth of love. May we be wise and faithful givers of kindness to those within reach as well as those beyond reach. May it be. Will you please rise in body or spirit and join in singing our first hymn this morning. It's number 357, Bright Morning Stars, an Appalachian folk song. Please join in, you'll get the feel for it.
Good morning, both to you in the hall, and now I know where to point and wave to those people online. I know that you are all enjoying uh, joining in here today. I understand that this month your theme is joy, which in ordinary times would seem like a no-brainer, a, well, duh, yes moment, with all the holidays and holy days that collide in this month. Why wouldn't we find joy? Yet these don't always feel like ordinary times, do they? On my side of the state in Kalamazoo, we've only seen the sun for about four hours this month. <laughs> Gray and dismal seem to be in the air. And don't get me started on our domestic political situation or the state of the world right now. Way too much of that seems antithetical to joy. And yet here we are with joy as the topic. Let's see if I can make any sense of it for us. Oh, and yes, yesterday as I was writing this up, two more small beams of sunlight came in through the window. <laughs> and that brought me joy. Have you ever watched a candle burn? The fire is alive. Just watch it. It moves, it flickers, it dances on the wind, it changes with every breath of air. The fire is alive. It's born, it grows, and then it dies. But fire is special. It can live again and again. People have always known that fire was special. Long, long ago, before people made matches or candles or even made houses, people knew that fire was special. There was the great fire in the sky. We might not see it so much this time of year, but the sun, which made the earth warm and made night into day. And there were smaller fires that people made, fires that cooked their food and kept them warm and brought them light. People honored the fires because fire was special. Fire was more than human. Fire has power. It can create and it can destroy. It can bring light, but it can burn. Fire can be wonderful and fire can be terrible. We have to be careful with fire. And so people thought that fire was something sacred and holy. Some people even worshiped fire and said that fire was a deity, like a god or a goddess. Other people said that fire wasn't actually the deity, but just meant that the deity was there. No matter what they believed, people all over the world gave fire a special place in their religions. They had fires in their homes, of course, to cook food and keep them warm. And they also had sacred fires in their temples. They set sacred lamps on their altars. They lit sacred bonfires outside on the hilltops and in the groves. They placed torches near the graves of those who died. And we still do this today. In Washington, D.C., at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, burns an eternal flame that never goes out. In churches at Christmas time, many Christians light four candles on an Advent wreath. During the eight days of Hanukkah, Jews light eight candles on a menorah. At Diwali, 
Hindus set small lamps called diyas all around the house. And when Unitarian Universalists gather, we light a chalice. This is our sacred fire. The flame gives us light and warmth, just like all fires. It's also a symbol, something we use to represent the light of learning. The chalice is a symbol too. A chalice is really just a big cup that you drink from. When you're thirsty, the nicest thing someone can do for you is to give you something to drink. Giving a drink to someone is a way of welcoming, welcoming them into your house. In a way, it means you're part of the same family, just like everyone here is a part of the same family, the Unitarian Universalist family. The picture of a flame in a chalice was first drawn by a man named Hans Deutsch during World War II for the Unitarian Service Committee. During the war, the committee needed a symbol to show refugees from many different countries that they were there to help. When refugees saw the picture of the flame in the chalice, it didn't matter what language they spoke. They understood that the symbol stood for hope or for help. Unitarian Universalists started using the flaming chalice in their worship services after that. Just like the sacred fires, people have used chalices in their religions for thousands and thousands of years. Long ago, the Greeks and Romans put wine in their chalices. Other people have put water or blood or milk or even melted butter into their chalices. The Celts believed drinking from the cauldron of the goddess Cairdwen would bring people back to life. Jesus shared a cup of wine with his friends, and many Christians still do this in religious celebrations today. We Unitarian Universalists don't drink from our chalice. Instead, we use it to hold the flame. The circle of the chalice helps keep the fire small. The flame doesn't blind us, it doesn't burn us, it gives us light so that we can see all the different things in the universe, even the invisible ones, because the Unitarian Universalist flame is a light of learning. The circle of our family keeps us warm, both our family at home and our Unitarian Universalist family. We help each other and we share food and drink with each other and we take care of each other because that's what families are supposed to do. And we invite everyone to come be a part of our family because the Unitarian Universalist chalice is a chalice that holds love. The flaming chalice is a symbol of learning and love. It's a beacon of hope, of joy, and of light. It's our symbol, the symbol of Unitarian Universalism. And today, we're going to borrow some of the flame from our chalice and bring it to Hodas Hall, where we'll be creating some wonderful treats and crafted delights that will unite us all in love and community. All of our children and youth are welcome to head over to the social hall to have some holiday fun and decorate some sugar cookies. <laughs> What some call taking the collection, taking reminds me of pulling, pulling, pulling. We don't do that. 
We think of it not as the collection, but as an action of gratitude. Gratitude for this community. Gratitude for how we deal with each other. Gratitude for what we take from this worship service out into the world and serve. Gratitude. Our mission is to be a free and welcoming religious community that encourages lives of integrity, honesty, learning which never stops, service to others, and yes, even joy, not guilt, but joy. So one way we live out this mission is by giving half of our weekly collection to an agency that follows essentially our own values. This month's plate collection, the recipient, is the welcome in. We have members of this church who are very interested in doing all they can to help the mission of the welcome in. I think of Annis Pratt and Julia. For many years, BUCers have volunteered at the Welcome Inn, which is on the corner of 13 Mile Road in Crooks in the Star Presbyterian Church. Now you may, some of you will recall that the minister of that church spoke here several weeks ago. On any given day, between December and March, up to 45 guests use this facility. Now, BUC volunteers help in a number of short and of one-time ways, too. They maintain, for example, the clothes closet. They serve lunch. They make purchases of emergent needs. Those needs being purchased through the 50% of what you give today and in other Sundays through the month of December. So you're all involved. You're all contributing to the Welcome Inn. And so now the ushers will please come forward.
we receive these gifts of gratitude with joy and with the knowledge of how they will be received and used in this church and in the outside organization. Thank you so much. Now, one thing that we have done since September is to uh, add to service what's called some uh, exercise, actually. And you may recall that um, several weeks ago I introduced one of these emerging items by asking you to think about a square as we breathe in and we hold a breath and then we breathe out and we rest and then we come back and we breathe in. Think of a square that you can hold in your hands and we do different things on each side of the square. So when we go up on one side of the square, we are breathing in through our nostrils. And then we're going to hold that for a count of four. And we come down to the count of four, exhaling through the mouth. And then we come over to the left again on the count of four and breathe in through the nose, hold, breathe out through the mouth, hold, Press. Now, I will do it once with you, and then I shall be silent while you do two of these exercises on your own. You should all be comfortable in your seats, and you now, each one of you, has an invisible square in front of you. So do it with me, please. We breathe in at the count of four. Hold, 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 hold. Exhale at the count of four through the mouth. And then come back over to the first part of our square. Now, you know it, so go ahead and do it. I'll just simply create the, the square for you. Thank you. Now I invite you to take that exercise with you. It doesn't hurt to do it several times a day. And now we move directly into the sharing of joys and sorrows. Art uh, Hillman uh, has a sorrow that tornadoes touched down a few miles from his family from the family farm. Six were killed, but members of his family are okay. A joy, December 7 was Marilyn Webster's birthday. She is one of the 90s. Uh, she may see this service later today. She's in uh, California for now, but uh, hopes to return to her home here in Bloomfield Hills uh, in the new year. And a sorrow from Carol Winslow. Her brother-in-law, Charlie Mester, Mester Ham, died December 8 at home in Harbor Springs. 
and a sorrow. Barb Shandeville's mother, Jackie Hopkins, passed away on Thursday morning, December 7. She was 93. Her girls were by her side at the moment of her passing. We'd like to thank, writes Barb, all our friends here at BUC for your thoughts of deep concern for us as we move through this. I invite you to join me now in the spirit of prayer, meditation, and the presence of community. In the joys and sorrows that have been shared, sometimes it is hard to know how to catch our breath or to rest with them. The death of Jackie Hopkins, of Carol Wiseman's brother-in-law, Charles, that six people did die in, um, in Kentucky or in Tennessee from the hurricanes, but thankfully not Art Hillman's family. And we celebrate Marilyn Webster's birthday. 90 years or more is a formidable accomplishment. And all the ones that have been spoken today mingle in our hearts and our spirits, our souls, as we hold to all that has not been spoken out loud, but resonates in our being as loud as a clanging cymbal or as soft as the touch of butterfly wings. Sometimes it is hard to turn to joy. The light grows dimmer literally as well as figuratively. It gets colder and I wonder how we can find energy to do the important things. Celebrate the holidays and holy days of this time of year. Find the perfect gift, send the chatty cards, decorate the house, let alone know how to clothe the naked, feed the hungry, whether hungry in body or in spirit, house the homeless? How do we reach across the divides that seem so often to pull communities asunder? So much is out there, and it feels impossible to change the slightest thing at times. And yet, and yet there is something indomitable that rises in the spirit, that breathes a bit of light, of hope, Waving to a neighbor, picking up trash, thinking charitable thoughts, smiling at someone, but it begins inside our beings, inside. Take a moment now to breathe in, breathe out. Be reminded that who you are matters, in and out, in and out. Remember, put on your own oxygen mask first. Without that, you may forget to breathe in and out, in and out. You may forget that you matter or your own worth, your own deserving to be loved, in and out. Remember most. You are loved. Remember, this is why we come together in religious community, to find places to kindle our hope, to see joys in the eyes of a friend. Breathe in the peace of this hour. Breathe out belief that we make a difference. Breathe in sorrow. 
Breathe out hope. Breathe in joy. Breathe out kindness. Breathe in love. Breathe out the possibility that together we will make it through. In and out, in and out. Amen. The reading I want to share with you today is by Robin Tanner. Robin is a Unitarian Universalist minister, poet, and activist who serves as the lead minister at Beacon Unitarian Universalist Congregation in Summit, New Jersey. <clears throat> she entitled this, What Will You Do With This? She begins with a quote by, from Albert Einstein. There are only two ways to live your life. One is though nothing is a miracle. The other is though everything is a miracle. This was not my plan for January 1st, 2017. Disheveled, wearing a pair of pajamas and with unbrushed teeth at the pediatric urgent care in New Jersey. Picture it, twin toddlers with a terrible cough and first time moms. I spent the night wavering between panic and fatigue while I listened to my son's labored breathing and my wife's blissful snoring. The doctor came in, sizing me up quickly. She took a few stethoscope listens, declaring, he has croup. If he starts wheezing again, take him outside. If it's really bad, she looked at me over her glasses, then bring him back. She is a sugar god to my son. I am the first timer scared in this omen for 2017, feeling adrift. We arrive home. After unpacking for our planned mountain hike, I select a movie. I walk into the bathroom and turn on the shower. I notice the light rays pouring from the window. I close my eyes letting the rays warm my face and water fall down on me. My children are alive. I am here. Um, mountaintop or not, this is here. And someday, none of us will be. The faces of everything I belong to, my ancestors, those I minister to and with, my children, my beloved, this sweet earth zoom into focus. I imagine the goddess squatting, elbows on knees, asking with the tone of a wise man, wise one, and what will you do with this? There is only one answer, one resolution to be given in this year with so many dimensions, privileges, injustices, betrayals, failures, and fears. I will be courageous. I will love deeply. I will resist. I will remember, I whisper. 
and then I'm whisked back to the practice of living. Mom, I need you to come wipe my nose now. It might be a little too trite or a bad pun for me to say that it's a joy to be with you today. Some of you heard, well, you all heard Ed say that I grew up in this congregation. I came as a very young family, a young child, as my family new to the area sought out religious community. In previous times I've been here, I bored you too often by telling you that my mother Betsy was the first pianist for the choir. I don't know if I've ever told you that I used to play with Russell Lincoln's daughter. He was one of your early ministers. My mom says that we took turns sacrificing the dolls we were meant to play with to our games of cowboys and Indians. <laughs> My picture appears in the first fundraising brochure for this building in the kindergarten class with my tambourine. <laughs> our family created our community with the choir members, many of whom, most of whom, are no longer here. And it is BUC that I blame for becoming a minister. <laughs> in addition to being involved in the choir, the church's addressograph and mimeograph machines, if you know what those are, and if not, Google it, they were in our basement, and I swear it was the fumes from those machines that addled my brain and said, you will be a UU minister. <laughs> we lived our life in this congregation. So thank you, I think. <laughs> and it is a joy to be here together, and yet the world is so full of woe. Growing up in the 1950s and 60s, it was hard for me to see the woe. We lived in a world of Sunday night TV lineup of Walt Disney and Ed Sullivan, and then when I was allowed to stay up that late, Bonanza. 
When woe hit those protagonists, we learned that good things and joy would happen before we, the final credits and we switched the channel. Life had its hardships, but if we were like Pollyanna, at least in Disney's version of that plucky heroine, if we just played the glad game and thought of what we were glad for, everything would work out fine. It was a make-believe world on TV that taught us that our lives should emulate that. And they gave me a sense that nothing bad would ever happen to the people I knew or loved, or if it did, it would be miraculously sorted out and everyone would live happily ever after, just after the last commercial break. I don't know how many of you grew up, had the luxury of growing up thinking that way too, that the world was a fair and just place and that all we had to do was wait through that next commercial break to see the good news of Pollyanna's approach shine through. These days, it's hard to believe that the glad game was so, so simply would turn things around. So much in the world these days, whether just outside the doors of this building or around the world, so much of it is lived in fear, violence, and woe. The sentencing this week of a young man who murdered the four at Oxford High School just up the road from here. The shootings this week at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and the other shootings in so many communities that happen daily but never make the news. They still tear our hearts asunder. The eco-catastrophes that are happening in response to the Earth's warming and bringing ever more people into the danger of losing all that they have and know. Wildfires, hurricanes, tornadoes, and volcanoes, and rising sea levels with air unfit for breathing. All of this is happening. And even here at BUC, a hard ending of your most recent ministry for some a relief, for others a heartbreak, for others both, and for still others utter confusion. What the heck did happen? It was a similar break with a minister decades ago that had my family choose to leave BUC. All of this happens, and that's to say nothing of the wars. Civil wars are raging in Afghanistan, Central Africa, African Republic, Ethiopia, Libya, Mali, Somalia, South Sudan, and Syria. To say nothing of the war between Ukraine and Russia, now on day 655. And there's no way that we can put out of our minds for long the war that was begun by Hamas and entered into by Israel on October 7th. Daily we read of the horrific things that have and are happening there. And my heart breaks with the death and destruction throughout the Middle East because in the simplest sense, the people there can't see or admit to seeing the humanity in each other. That's a simplistic way of defining it to be sure, but it is oh so much more complex than that and centers on who has the right to live where, who has the right to even exist. How can you move forward after centuries of harm? All of this and so much more like domestic violence and the ravages of drugs on human beings, the lack of control women have over their own bodies and too many, way too many things to mention weigh down our hearts as if there is never any possibility of joy anywhere at any time. As the days grow shorter, that is Michigan in the winter, it seems as if the force of darkness could overcome us all. And yet, this month we are meant to be talking about joy. And yet, there are still miracles that happen every day, even in the midst of the woes of the world. 
that these I believe in. Let me tell you where I see miracles in the midst of joy and joy in the midst of woe. Thursday night began the Jewish festival of Hanukkah or festival of lights. The story, as you know, is a simple one. The Maccabees uh, defeated the colonizing, colonizing Seleucids and they were able to recapture the temple in Jerusalem and rededicated it. The problem was all the holy oil had been um, destroyed. They found one vial that should have only lasted one days, one day. And yet in faith and hope, they lit this vial in the lamps. And the miracle is that the oil lasted for eight days until new oil could be made. In the midst of the sorrow of war, they were able to bring more light back to a temple that they thought had been lost. Miracle and joy intertwined with destruction. This year, the ceremony of Hanukkah was poignant in Kalamazoo. Just three weeks ago, someone vandalized the home of the rabbi who lives four blocks from me, spray painting his home and the religious display outside with swastikas. The community was outraged. Neighbors and others came to help clean up and reassure, reassure Rabbi Haller and his family that they would be protected. Well, this past Thursday night, the community was invited to a rally and Hanukkah menorah lighting because, as Rabbi Haller said, you can't fight darkness with darkness. You can only fight it with light. We gathered together, sang songs of peace and hope, and lit candles to help increase the light in the world. The rabbi gave us little plastic toy banks in the shape of an ark. And he said that ARK, A-R-K, didn't stand for acts of random kindness, but instead should stand for acts of routine kindness, imploring us to put this where we could see it and do at least one act of routine kindness every day. Out of the woefulness of the destruction that was designed to bring fear to the rabbi and his family, a, deep, a sense of deeper, wider connection of love and light appeared. Another example, an 18-year-old friend was recently diagnosed with a rare and aggressive form of cancer. His folks are self-employed, and thankfully, through the Obamacare, they have health insurance for their children. There is no doctor, though, in Kalamazoo who specializes in Jay's form of cancer, so they are forced to travel four hours away to Indianapolis to get him treated. The diagnosis has been devastating to them. Coming to terms with how this will change their son's life and the financial implications when every day spent with their child means losing out the income for the family. How will they do, deal with that and handle the medical bills? But even in the midst of this woe, miracles abound. They are reminded of the preciousness of life and connections. They have increased the love in their family, pulling together in new ways that the blended family had not always been able to do before. And through friends, they were able to get one of the nation's best providers and caretakers of this type of cancer to take on their son. The doc says that Jay will survive and most likely fully recover. And the cost of at least $16,000 in deductibles and travel to an accommodation in Indianapolis, far from home, could have crippled them financially for years. But someone with my friend's grudging acceptance, who wants their financial issues out there in the world? The friend created a GoFundMe account. Because the parents give so much of themselves to the wider community and our beloved people, over $40,000 was donated in four days. The light that this family has shown to so many others has come back to them full force. In the midst of woe, they are experiencing a deep joy 
and recognizing the miracle of being alive. One last example for today. When I was the minister at our Southfield congregation just down the road, we too did joys and sorrows. I will never forget the one Sunday when a young person, about 10 or 12, got up and talked about how the year before he had tried out for a hockey team and did not make it. So he said that he had practiced and practiced as hard as he could this year, and he tried out again that week. And guess what? He didn't make it. Yet the young person continued to say, so I guess I'll just have to practice harder this year. What could have been devastation was instead celebrated, spoken about in his religious home as an understanding that there can be joy and discovery in trying again, even when you don't make the team. Now, I feel like I'm in danger here of being too much like Pollyanna to say that things will all wrap up in a 60 or 90 minute TV show. That's not for me. For those of you who are old enough to remember the poem about Monday's child is fair of face and Tuesday's child is fair, uh, full of grace and so on, let me tell you that deep in my spirit, I am the Wednesday child who is full of woe. Let me confess now that I am so much more at home in the presence of sorrow than I am in joy. I am more comfortable visiting people in the hospital or conducting memorial services and being with people in those hard times than doing weddings or other joyful occasions. I prefer minor key music. One of my favorite hymns contains the the line, joy and woe are woven fine, clothing for the soul divine. Joy often does not need companionship the way that woe does. And it is in that journey together that I feel called to go and to be. And yet, even in the presence of woe in my spirit and in my my birthday, I too look for miracles that abound every day around us, especially when thinking of woe. Sitting with people in hard times, bringing casseroles when death or illness visits our neighbors or friends, visiting at times of sorrow, donations to people on the street or to welcome in or to the GoFundMe accounts of people whose lives touch us. These are just some of the miracles we can find in woeful times. They are reminders of joy, just as is that baby's first breath or watching a toddler get up again and fall again over and over again, or the finding of true love. The miracle of standing again once we've fallen, even when it might take a long time to get back to our feet. That in the midst of the hardest times, we can be there for and with each other. We don't have to know the right words. We don't have to bring the right gifts. Sometimes, often, just our presence is enough. In quiet companionship or a note on a Facebook page, sometimes knowing that others are with us, that we are not alone, is enough to bring more light into the world during woeful times and rekindle the possibility of joy. I don't have the answers to what is happening around the world and the divisions that are popping up so quickly between left and right, the liberals and conservatives, the warring parties around the world or in our own neighborhoods. I don't know how to stop that. I don't know how to make that end. But I do know that each of us, each of us has the power to look for the miracles in the midst of the woeful times to see a way to bring just one more spark of light to warm each other's spirits, each other's souls, each other's beings, each other's hearts. To do acts of routine kindness today and every day, even just a smile, 
a nod of the head at the passing stranger, the quiet acknowledgement that I see you and you are full of worth and are worthy of love. Acts of routine kindness can bring us all joy, giver and receiver alike. May you, in this time of diminishing daylight, find a way to bring one more spark of light into this woeful world. And may it always be so. Thank you, Reverend Lisa. And in the spirit of singing with joy and jubilance, would you please rise in body and spirit and join in one of our beloved hymns, There's More Love Somewhere. Uh, you don't probably need anything except your bodies. Feel free to add some no-fault <laughs> harmony in there. And let's sing with real fullness. Here we go. As we extinguish the flame of the chalice today, may it go into your heart, providing a spark of light and hope and joy for you. As you hear these words by friend and colleague, Wayne Arneson. Take courage, friends. The way is often hard, the path is never clear, and the stakes are very high. Take courage. For deep down, there is another truth. You are not alone. Amen. <laughs> 